It seems like construction is everywhere. Cranes, trucks, and cones crowd street corners as new apartment buildings or office spaces are put up. The annoyance of construction is only a fraction of a building's lifetime. Once it's built, it sits and gets used. Lights turn on, air conditioning runs, people come and go until ultimately... This whole life cycle of a building consumes a lot of energy and produces a lot of emissions. The International Energy Agency, the IEA, estimates that buildings contribute about 40% of annual carbon dioxide emissions. Today on What's Up Wisconsin, we'll be exploring our built environment, looking to understand why our buildings use so much energy and what we can do to make them more efficient. You're listening to What's Up Wisconsin, brought to you by the Wisconsin Energy Institute, where we explore your questions on energy in Wisconsin. I'm communications intern Britta Wellenstein. You're not alone when you think construction seems to be everywhere. With the population expected to grow to 9.8 billion by 2050, infrastructure will need to keep up. But there's a lot that can be done to make sure these new buildings consume less energy and have lower carbon footprints. To learn more about building efficiency, I spoke to Joy Altwise from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Joy is the program director for the Office of Interdisciplinary Professional Program and the Masters of Sustainable Systems Engineering at UW. What would you say is the overarching goal of building efficiency? So with our buildings, I would say the whole point is to reduce our use of resources. It, that sounds kind of straightforward, but when you think about it, why would you want to waste resources, right? <laughs> so with our buildings, there's a lot of things we can do differently compared to how we've traditionally designed, built, and operated buildings that can be much more efficient, both from uh, an environmental perspective and also for the health of the the occupants. So there's a lot of things we're trying to accomplish to actually reduce resources. A lot of times people get caught up just in looking at the energy part of it, but it's not just energy. There's a lot of other environmental aspects and indoor health that are just as important. Yeah, and that is kind of my next question because a lot of the numbers people cite for buildings is usually the energy consumption, which I will cite right now. So in the, the building sector accounts for about 40% of annual global carbon dioxide emissions. And a lot of that comes from just the operations and like the occupancy of the building. And then a portion of that also comes from construction. So what's kind of accounting for these numbers and for this energy consumption and CO2 emission from buildings? So the first thing I want to point out is when you talk about the building sector. To understand what that means, you need to look at the whole economy. So the economy, when you look at where energy goes, they basically divide it into three categories, the building sector, industry, and transportation. So when we talk about the building sector, we're talking about anything that is built, basically anything with walls and a roof that you can walk into. Mm -hmm. So any of the emissions associated with that sector are from either construction of buildings or operation of buildings. When you look at where does the energy go, it's essentially two pieces. There's electricity and then there's direct fuel. Every building home out there, most of them have both. The easy one to understand is when you burn fuel directly in the building. So whether it's your house and you have a natural gas furnace or whether it's a commercial building or a warehouse where they have maybe, you know, gas heaters, gas furnaces as well, perhaps even gas water heaters, they're burning that fuel directly on site. So that's where the emissions are coming from. Mm -hmm. The electricity piece is the one that tends to confuse people a little bit. (laughs) So a lot of the energy that we use in our buildings and homes is electricity. And so if you're not familiar with this area, you might think, well, how, are, how is electricity causing any emissions? Well, you have to trace it back to where it came from. So the electricity doesn't just appear, right? <laughs> so it's coming from either your local utility or if you're really ahead of the game, perhaps you're generating your electricity on site. But if it's coming from your local utility, you got to look at how are they making that electricity. So Joy says if your local utility company, you know, the one charging you for using electricity, uses carbon-based or high-emission fuels like coal or natural gas to power their electrical lines, by using their electricity, you are indirectly producing emissions. But even if a building cannot change the ultimate source of energy, there's a lot they can do to decrease how much energy they consume, and thus their carbon impact. You can do all kinds of things uh, to reduce your emissions. It's helpful to look at the life cycle phases of buildings. 
So mm-hmm. we have the construction, the operation, and then at, at the end of life, we can either renovate or we can demolish or deconstruct. Every one of those phases can be improved. In the construction phase, that's a little more complicated. So yeah. you got to think about, are there ways to reduce how much energy or other, there, there are other sustainability aspects can happen during the construction phase. For example, how far you ship materials to a construction site it, that impacts how much energy was needed to actually build that building, right? We think of that as what we call embodied carbon or embodied oh, okay. energy. So for example, if you decided to build a new building or a new home and you decided to get all of your materials locally, the transportation required to get those materials would have a lot less fuel needed than if you, let's say, got all of your wood from the Pacific Northwest or you (laughs) ordered a lot of marble from Italy. So there's a lot of choices we can make materials-wise to reduce embodied carbon. Although construction may be the most prominent and annoying part of a building's life, Operational activities, the pure occupation and use of a building, are what consume the most energy. According to the IEA, building operations alone account for 30% of global final energy consumption and 26% of global energy-related emissions. But there are ways to reduce this energy consumption. Heating and cooling are one of the bigger drivers of energy consumption and emissions. The IEA reports that fossil fuels supply over 60% of heating demand, but a building's design can play a big role in limiting this. It first starts with the materials used. Better insulating materials and more efficient windows help make sure heat isn't lost in the winter or cooling isn't escaping in the summer. Using passive design and daylighting can help decrease energy needed to heat and cool buildings. Passive solar design is a design technique that uses daylight to both help light an area, but also naturally heat an area. Likewise, greenery and green roofs help to naturally cool buildings. But the mechanical heating and cooling systems can also be made more sustainable. There are a lot of things that we can do to recover wasted heat, for example, or to provide more efficient cooling. It can be as simple as choosing the most efficient appliance. Let's say you're talking about your home. There are definitely differences if you're looking at a heating system. Everybody knows, well, hopefully everybody knows those yellow energy guide labels from the government, right? Uh, If you were to look at your furnace, they come with those as well. You can buy a more efficient one versus a less efficient one. When you get into more complicated systems like commercial buildings, there's lots of options. (laughs) I have an entire professional society dedicated to figuring (laughs) out how to do this better. We talk about things like dedicated outdoor air systems. We talk about things like high-efficiency chillers. We talk about geothermal energy systems. Geo is a real big one right now because a lot of buildings are Mm -hmm. really trying to what they call decarbonize. So they're trying to electrify. So one of the ways you can do heating and cooling with electricity efficiently is to use a geothermal system. So that's a big one Uh, that's coming Mm -hmm. up as a trend right now. Again, I have to caution folks, make sure you're checking your grid. If you're, if you're going to an all-electric building, make sure you're on a clean grid. Um, you don't want to actually make things worse in the, in the interim. I know eventually we'll get to the point where our utility grids are pretty clean, but we're not quite there yet, <laughs> so be careful yeah. with that. Um, but there's tons of things just in heating and cooling alone. However, these mechanical changes aren't something many existing buildings can implement. But there are small changes that can make a big difference, like switching to LED light bulbs, which use 75% less energy than incandescent light bulbs, according to the Department of Energy. As Joy has seen, a lot of this change comes from the individuals occupying a building and pushing for energy-reducing measures. In the operation phase, in my experience, with some of the research that we've gotten done in ASHRAE, which is my professional society, we found that one of the biggest factors that impact whether a building is a high performance uh, long term is actually the people running it. So it's the people. If you have dedicated energy managers, facility managers who really care about energy, if you have occupants in your building who are dedicated and excited about having a sustainable building, that makes a huge surprisingly huge difference in terms of the overall building performance. You can have simple basic systems in a building that aren't technically all that super high efficient or high tech, but if you have dedicated people running them, it's it makes all the difference. It can be as simple as little things like turning off the lights at night, turning your computer off at night, setting the temperature back at night when people are not there. It's simple things like that that make a big difference. And I don't want to just focus on energy, like you say. Focus on, focusing, focusing on energy is great, and we definitely need to do it. But sustainability in buildings is not just energy. 
there's a lots of things, especially health. The reason we have buildings is to serve some sort of purpose for people, right? So we don't want to ignore the people who are in the buildings, either w- whether it's your home or where you work. Uh, making sure we're paying attention to how much like ventilation air, how much outside air, choosing materials that don't off-gas toxic emissions. A lot of our products do that. You may not realize it. Um, people love new car smell, but I hate to tell you it's not a good thing. So choosing uh, materials for health reasons, connection to the outdoors, they call it biophilia, being able to go outdoors. Sometimes we have things like green roof terraces and things that connect the indoors and the outdoors. Uh, it's a health aspect. So mm-hmm. finding ways to make buildings healthier, but sometimes it's weird stuff like designing your buildings to have prominent inviting staircases. If you walk into the building and you see the stairs right there and they look really nice, if you just need to go to a, up a floor, maybe you, you'll choose the stairs instead of the elevator, right? So it, not only is that impacting your health a little bit, but it's also it's just tiny reduction in electricity from not using the elevator, right? Yeah. So it's things like that. It's, it's you know careful attention to design features like that. I think it's interesting, the not split, but you have to have good design, both in terms of people and how they interact with the space and then also in terms of energy. But then you also need someone to maintain it. And I feel like we often miss one or the other in that sort of toggle. Yeah. And it's hard with uh, facility management in particular. We're not doing a good job industry wide in terms of incentivizing and hiring folks to go into that industry to care strongly about the performance we don't really incentivize them to you know what's your energy goal for next year you know Mm -hmm. that kind of thing so you know for a lot of building owners they're concerned with other aspects of their building operation they're not as concerned with the the energy and the environment but it you know it varies by owner but we really need to have you know a stronger focus on facility engineering as a career and something with advancement and good pay and trying to draw in folks who have, you know, a little bit of a tech leaning to operate the systems and make a career out of it. And you mentioned there, there's not really a motivation to go back year and year and check how the building's operating, but there is a lot of motivation in the design side of things, which leads me to LEED certified buildings. First off, LEED is an acronym. I have no idea what it stands for, actually. And then could you explain what that acronym means? Um, Absolutely. So LEED, which is L-E-E-D, stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And it is a green building rating system. It's been around since the late 90s. And it's run by an organization called the U.S. Green Building Council. And it's not the only green building rating system out there, but it's one of the more popular ones. LEED is pretty flexible. They, um, they have categories, and then you can pick and choose. You can, as long as you do enough um, to get enough points to get the award, it's pretty flexible. So they have categories like uh, your, your site, so your sustainable sites, uh, water efficiency, energy efficiency, materials and resources. So they have all kinds of categories and they have points in each one of them. It's flexible for building owners. It's a really nice program to help building owners sort of enter that market to say, how green can I be? They can go from the entry level of doing just enough to get their, their first award. Or, you know, if they're building a lot of buildings or if they just want to really show what they can do, they can go as high as platinum, which is obviously getting a lot more points. But LEED is still only in the initial construction of the building. It doesn't kind of check back in to see how they're operating. Well, they do now, actually. Okay. They have, in some of the later versions now, they do require you to have a plan in place for your operation. They have what they call lead for existing buildings. Okay. So they have the new construction version, and then now they want you to also continue on into the existing building version. After operation, we reach the last stage of a building. Hey, but it's not all wrecking ball demolition. For end of life. Mm -hmm. So when we get to the end of the life of a building, there's two things you can do. Well, there's actually three. You can renovate, you can demolish, or you can deconstruct. And so I think everybody hopefully knows what renovation is. I won't go into that. Demolition, of course, is, you know, smushing it and sending it to the landfill. (laughs) Pretty much, right? Maybe (laughs) knock it down, scoop it up, take it to a landfill. Um, And that's historically what we've done. Deconstruction is actually a much better idea. And deconstruction is where we go in and exactly what it sounds like. We take it apart, Mm -hmm. salvage the good stuff, and reuse the good stuff as much as we can. 
And there's a lot of opportunity to do that. There's actually two or three things that make that more viable. For one, you need to have a local market for the materials. Our cities and towns and our regions need to have a way to find buyers for those deconstructed materials. You also need labor. It does take longer to deconstruct a building, and you need people to do it. And then you need time. If you're under a time crunch, it's going to be tough to do deconstruction effective. So a lot of proper planning needs to go into it. And there's one sort of additional item that is going to be a little harder to solve, and that is we need to build our buildings initially with deconstructible materials. Yeah, so that's also front of house kind mm-hmm. of design aspects that yeah. we have to consider. Unfortunately, we're finding right now as we're trying to deconstruct some of our buildings that some of the materials we've used over the last you know half century or so are not deconstructible. Either the glues we used or the binders or the fillers or whatever, and we try to take it apart and it just destroys the materials. Then do you know what materials now are being able to be salvaged? Well, the big ones are things like brick. You know, the ones that are clearly, if you can get them out, they're ready to be reused if they're clean, right? Other things are not. They can be torn out and repurposed, but not reused. For example, drywall. In some cases, you can grind that up and reuse it, like for agricultural purposes, but it's not a direct reuse. reuse. Like you're not putting it up in another building. (laughs) Things like brick is a big one. Sometimes they can grind concrete materials um, and reuse those as sort of, it's almost reuse, but, you know, repurposing it on on the next site, on the same building site. Um, There's a lot of salvageable wood, some beautiful old wood in some some of the old buildings. And you'd be surprised where you find, you know, places Um, where you wouldn't expect it. And you just walk in and you see these gorgeous beams. You're like, oh my gosh, please tell me you're not crushing that. (laughs) So there's a lot of things like that you find in some surprising places. As we think about old buildings, so someone has an older building, they're thinking about either tearing it down or retrofitting it to serve their needs. So from a sustainability aspect, is it better to tear that down and build something new that you can add all the passive design and heating and cooling you want? Or is it better to just retrofit these old materials? That's a hard one. That's a hard question. Uh, it's, pre- it's hard because there's no direct answer for everybody. From a strictly embodied energy or embodied carbon point of view, most of the studies I've seen to date have shown that reusing old buildings is the better choice, if you can. But that's the question. Can you? Some old buildings we just can't save. Some buildings we don't want to save. And there can be a variety of reasons. If the original design was so terrible that it's not going to serve any purpose or if it's going to be worse than just tearing it down. Um, Sometimes there's contamination of Mm -hmm. various types of things, asbestos, etc. There can be severe deterioration, and sometimes it's economic. Sometimes the cost is just so high to do it that you can't. Now, those are all the bad things, (laughs) but there's also lots of opportunity to actually reuse buildings into something you you would not even believe. I'm going to give you an example that is my absolute favorite for the last couple of years. It's actually here in Wisconsin. I I highly recommend you go Google uh, the Beloit College Student Center, and they repurposed a coal plant. Wow. An actual Blackhawk generating station coal plant. Out of all the buildings, that was the last one I was expecting. Last thing you would ever imagine, you can turn a coal plant into a student center. It's absolutely awe-inspiring. And if, so if a coal plant can be turned into a useful student center, uh, I don't know, I think we can do anything. Then to transition to a, a last question, what are, what are your hopes for the future of building efficiency? What, what do you see as like the ideal future? I think we are on a really good track right now, seeing what's going on in, our, in the industry in terms of current building design. It's become much more mainstream to have mm-hmm. green things, sustainability features considered in, in a lot of projects. We've got certain areas of the country who, that are adopting green codes, either as a requirement or an option. So getting everybody to build green, which is exciting. (laughs) I've been around long enough to know that 20 years ago, it was pulling teeth to get anybody to even consider it, you know. So we're making huge strides. I think as the grid gets cleaner, it's going to be easier to do things. It's going to be easier to justify a lot of the choices of systems. 
I mean, we're only one sector, one of the three sectors of the economy, but we, we affect everybody. We all interact with the built environment. So the greener we can make it. And it's so inspiring to see such great examples. And, and buildings like schools and college uh, campus buildings that are open to the public, where the public can come see what's being done, either through interactive exhibits or seeing you know what was designed in the building or taking a tour that just inspires everybody I think to see what's possible as Joy said looking at new technologies and design features buildings are installing can be incredibly fascinating so I did just that to see how efficient buildings are designed and what it looks like to implement these changes I looked at the new computer data and information sciences building actively being constructed on UW-Madison's campus I am at the CDIS construction grounds. It's tucked in between Johnson and University Avenue. There's a backhoe, an excavator, a bunch of piles of 4x4s and 2x4s, and all of these construction joints. To learn more about sustainable design, I spoke to Tom Erickson, the head of the CDIS building. So the new building is uh, designed to be a home for our school, which is a new school we created in 2019. Uh, it includes a combination of the departments of computer sciences, statistics, and the information school. The building is expected to be LEED Platinum certified, the highest LEED certification. One of the stipulations our donor had is to make it the most sustainable building on campus. That is our goal. We have some really fun and interesting things that are going to be apparent or obvious, such as solar panels on the roof and uh, green roofs. That greenery is also part of the sustainability. So how much biophilia we're putting in and outside of the building is an important consideration as well. So. There are some other features that you won't just naturally see, but know that they're there. We're putting triple pane uh, windows in, which, which is a luxury for a, a building. We're, we're able to do that because of fortunate donors. We, this is an entirely privately funded building, so there's no state funding going into the building. So we get a chance to design it to a standard where we, we really want to be this sustainable. It's, it's actually hard, believe it or not, to build state buildings that are highly sustainable because it costs more money. But we're putting in triple pane windows. We've got a very interesting cooling system that is done through bars that are in the ceiling of each room. And those bars carry cold water and that will cool the, the building down. And that's much more sustainable than, than conventional forced air, air conditioning. And then another thing that you we won't see, but it's a big part of the whole picture, is recycling stormwater or, or rainwater. When it rains outside, we'll be collecting that water and putting them into large underground tanks. This collected rainwater will be used to water the green roofs, as well as restrooms to flush toilets. But outside of operational design factors, the design focuses on sustainable construction as well. One of the things, you know, we thought about Breda was a carbon footprint around just construction of the building. So it's quite common, you know, the, the facades for these buildings, we want to make them look nice, right? And uh, another thing we needed to do is to fit into the neighborhood. But the uh, facades for the, some of the other buildings, uh, in the case of the chemistry building, the facades come from Germany. But we wanted to be more locally sourced and we're very fortunate that our architects came up with something called high performance concrete so it, if it's not very thick it still is very strong and we'll use that as the facade or the side in the building and it can be manufactured locally so i know many of these practices to make buildings more sustainable they're often more expensive at the forefront but then you have less energy costs so how is that a factor in thinking about the maintenance of the building and not just the design well, that was a huge factor. I'm glad you asked that question, Britta, because, you know, after we do the design and then there's a hard part that comes, it's called the bidding. And then because our bid was higher than what our budget was, we had to come in and look at how we're going to cut costs. The good news is, you know, in a lot of these areas, like the triple pane glass, for example, that will save us a lot of money in heating in the winter. And so we are excited in the long run on the maintenance of the building that these things will have an impact. As we were trying to cut costs in there, we were able to weigh the pros and cons of each of these items and decide whether we wanted to continue with that design, you know, with the notion of what it will save us in the long run versus uh, cut the upfront costs. 
from a maintenance perspective, we did a very thorough review after the design to make sure the building was highly maintainable and we were keeping those things that were going to be cost saving versus adding to maintenance costs downstream. The building is expected to be completed and occupied in fall of 2025, but planning for the building looked well past the opening day. We didn't think about sustainability just from uh, the energy use and consumption and, and that. We also thought about it in terms of how long the building will live. Sustainable to us also means will this have a long lifetime. The interior is very flexible. There is an ability to easily change walls and move things and redesign. So in 50 years time, if it's not CDIS that's in the building, it's someone else, they can configure it to their needs. The simplicity of the design was really important too, in terms of not trying to create anything that we thought in time might date itself. It might be the coolest thing right now, but how will we feel about this in 50 years time? Right now you can see roughly two stories of just bare bones structure and then a pit. That's kind of it. It's weird to think that there was something here before and it's even weirder to think of what's going to be here come two years' time. Thanks for listening in. Do you have questions about energy? Wondering how new energy solutions are taking off in Wisconsin? Let us know by sending an email at communications at or tweet UW Energy and tag WhatsUpWI.